Good evening, everyone. I am especially delighted to welcome you to our Zoom discussion tonight, as it will be quite different format from what we've done in our previous 30 plus discussions. Instead of a panel of art experts, I am thrilled to be collaborating with filmmaker Marty Gross and enabling all of you to have a taste of what has become Marty's career long passion, the restoration and production of Japanese historical film footage on Japanese crafts and culture from a range of subjects as diverse as bunraku and kabuki to Zen Buddhism and DT Suzuki, and today's focus on ceramic production in the Showa era. Hopefully, like me, you'll be captivated to see and learn how the art of, quote unquote, the unknown craftsman emerged in the 20th century, and perhaps then better understand how such life-sustaining production work set the stage for the world of clay art in Japan as we know it today. Some of you might wonder why it has taken me so long after a five decade fascination with Japanese ceramics to at long last turn my attention to minge. After all, it has often been this genre of Japanese ceramics that modern Americans first discovered as they entered this seductive world. The name Hamada Shoji has long been synonymous with Japanese clay. But how he managed to change that international perception and the course of localized village production will be made evident with the film samplings you're about to see. However, for me, in 1973, I was actually introduced to Hamada while an undergraduate traveling in Japan, touring ceramic villages, kiln sites, and museums. So in some way, he too was at the starting gate of my career path. That visit made a powerful impression on me as I felt I had visited ceramic royalty. And indeed, he was totally dressed for the part in what I learned to be costly handwoven garments. It is only recently and with my visits uh, to my gallery with Marty that I've come to appreciate just how significant the appreciation of Minge by the West was to the elevation of clay to an art form. Now, for those audience members who may be unfamiliar with the term minge, it literally means art of the people, or what we in the West typically describe as folk art or handicraft. In Japan, these are locally produced serviceable objects intended for daily use that display a simplicity of design and workability of form. Immensely practical and totally functional, such wares highlight both the local materials and their regional traditions and aesthetics. They were fabricated to be accessible to everyone or the people in terms of price, function, materials, and design. The term itself was coined in 1925 by three key, key figures in the movement, Ninagi Soetsu, Kawai Kanjiro, and Hamada Shoji. It was derived from Yanagi, Yanagi Soetsu's term, Minshu Teki Koge, the people's art. And with these figures at the helm, the Japanese Folk Art Association was launched. In response to machine-made and factory-made products that flooded the early 20th century Japan, regional folk ceramics embraced functional wares made by hand with traditional styles and techniques from a broad range of materials beyond clay, including wood, textiles, paper, metal, and even painting and printmaking. It was Inagi Soetsu, a philosopher, writer, critic, who following visits to Korea in the 19 teens was able to inspire the place of Japanese handicrafts within a rapidly modernizing society. When he returned to Japan, he started to collect the ordinary wares that were disappearing in favor of mass produced consumer goods. Influenced by William Morris, William Blake, and Walt Whitman, he then befriended the seminal figure D.T. Suzuki and seriously focused on Suzuki's Zen Buddhist teachings and his emphasis on freedom and spontaneity. In 1936, together with potters Hamada and Kawai, Yanagi established the Japanese Folk Craft Museum in Tokyo. His book, The Unknown Craftsman, was enormously influential. 
This book was translated 1931 into English by Bernard Leach, a British potter born in Hong Kong who grew up in Asia. He returned to Japan after his studies in native England and took up pottery, first apprenticing with Kenzon VI. In 1919, he met Hamada Shoji after seeing his work in an exhibition. And the very next year, they traveled to the UK where Leach set up his studio, Leach Pottery, that still exists in St. Ives, Cornwall. Hamada then returned to Japan and established himself in Mashiko, a ceramic community about 60 uh, miles north of Tokyo in Tochigi Prefecture. Leach would later publish a potter's book in 1940, which introduced Japanese pottery ideas to the West and was a seminal work in the field for uh, foreign uh, potters. Hamada became a, of course, became a professional potter, like his classmate Kawai Kanjiro. In the second half of the 20th century, outside of Japan, he was arguably the most well-recognized Japanese potter, perhaps on par with Kita Oji Rosanjin. As I said, he's a founding member of the Japanese Folk Art Association. In 1955, he was one of the very first potters to be designated a living national treasure, and he encouraged and influenced many younger potters who came to the area, including Shimoka Tatsuzo and Kamoda Shoji. So in, su in summary, for you to keep in mind as we go through this uh, discussion with Marty, the five general tenets of traditional Japanese folk art were, they need to be unsigned underscore their functionality and simplicity. They had to be inexpensive and unsophisticated. They had to be reflective of their locale. And of course, they needed to be made by hand. But the best examples of Minge also need to possess beauty, as well as embody suitability to their purpose. After the establishment of Minge as a genre, the main exception for contemporary Minge material that it could be made by artists who are also craftsmen. It's an interesting uh, distinction. The universal appeal of Minge is evident in our totally global audience tonight. With us, we have nearly 500 registrants from 23 countries truly spanning the globe. From Europe and beyond, we have France, Spain, Switzerland, Russia, Denmark, and the UK. From North America, besides the United States, we have Canada and Bermuda. From Asia, of course, we have Japan, Singapore, South Korea. From the African continent, we have Algeria, Angola, Israel, South America, and Zimbabwe. From Central and South America, Brazil, Costa Rica, and Uruguay. And from down under, both New Zealand and Australia, with an especially large number of attendees. The U.S., which has been so captivated for Minge for decades, is represented by more than 30 states. We are also really delighted to welcome over two dozen museum professionals from around the world and faculty from over a dozen universities. More importantly, I wish to acknowledge the representatives tonight with us tonight from the Minge International Museum and from the Leach Pottery in Cornwall, as well as a large body of active potters. Finally, I must uh, offer my heartfelt thanks to the Japanese Arts Society of America, the Japan Society of New York, and Asia Week New York for their help in getting the word out and getting all of you here with us tonight. It is equally thrilling to be welcoming many first-time viewers to this program, so I am hoping um, you will be hooked by this wonderful program and continue to join our future Zoom uh, programming. We very much expect to have plenty of time for questions, so please submit them via the Q&A function on your screen. So with that very brief welcome and introduction, I would now like to formally introduce Marty before posing my first question. Marty Gross is an award-winning, excuse me, award-winning filmmaker as both director and producer of titles that include Potters at Work of 1976, among many others. For the past 50 years, he has operated Mardi Gros Studio, and he is the founder and director of the Minge Film Archive, 
that is devoted to the restoration and preservation of documentary films on various aspects of Japanese folk art, most especially ceramics. Marty himself studied pottery making in Japan in the 1970s and began filmmaking in 1974 in Toronto, then later in Japan. He has been commissioned by major international distribution companies to produce more than 60 interviews on the history of Japanese cinema with Japanese directors, actors, cinematographers, and screenwriters. In 2008, he completed the restoration of the Leech Pottery 1952, which would become the start of his ongoing project, the Minge Film Archives, that is the subject of our talk today. Consisting of close to 60 short films covering the history of folk crafts, particularly pottery making, the archive has become an invaluable resource. In addition to the restoration of the actual film itself, typically silent, Marty has visited senior craftsmen to record their oral histories. These commentaries in turn have become an essential and integral part of his films. Incredibly insightful, these films have been shown at special events and in museums around the world. Marty himself divides his time between North America and Japan, and I am totally thrilled to be collaborating with him tonight to bring this very important work to the attention of our audience. So Marty, my first question to you tonight, mm -hmm. uh, for those who are with us who may have a passing familiarity with the Minge movement, Hamada Shoji is one of the most recognizable figures. His appearances in many films and programs that were broadcast all over the world have made him instantly identifiable. As a filmmaker, Marty, what do you think was the unique appeal of seeing pottery making through the medium of film? And specifically of seeing Hamada Shoji at work, how did such films help spread the word about Minge? Marty? Well, initially, thank you. Thanks, Jonah. Thank you for that long introduction, boy. <laughs> I hardly recognize myself. Um, well, first of all, you, you know, Filming pottery has a charm, which, of course, you know, it's magical no matter how many times you watch it. So the act of pottery making uniquely lends itself as a craft, uniquely lends itself to filmmaking. And there have been many films about potters made for, for many decades. But Hamada is uh, unique in the place because in addition to Hamada, what you see is is the context in which he works, the place that he created the environment that he created with his workers, the environment that he created, uh, that he created. And when I say he created it, it, he emulated the traditional crafts situation of the Mashiko potters, but the, his own place was quite unique. It was quite different from, you know, he built his studio he, from the local, you know, with the help of local people, and he created the his own work environment, which was, particularly in the 1970s, for those of us who'd never visited Japan or had opportunities to, you know, this was a dream place to work. I mean, think the other alternative was to go to a school to learn pottery. <laughs> so watching Hamada and other craftspeople in that context was, of course, a dream for many people. And as you know, many, many Americans and international uh, craftspeople went to Japan to study and to, but it was the attraction of the environment, I believe, as well, of the context, I should say. I'm going to show a film now uh, about um, a short film that we made for the National Museum of Catalonia. Um, and um, it's seven minutes long, and it's got natural sounds only. So I hope, and I'm going to show this film from beginning to end. Uh, and I'll just give you a little bit of discussion. This is here we are in Mashiko in 1970. This film was reconstructed from um, you're not missing any sound. There's just natural sound here. OK, uh, this film was reconstructed from uh, outtakes of a film that was made uh, in 1970 that was uh, filmed in 1970 at in Mashiko and also in Cornwall. 
And uh, we prepared this very short film for the National Museum of Catalonia, as I just said. Here's Hamad at his wheel. And this is a very unique experience watching this man at this terocro, hand-driven wheel. You know, the hand-driven wheel is, it's very, very, very rare to see this. There were potters in Mashiko who used the terocro, the hand-driven hand wheel, but, and the principle of this is that wheel the, made of wood, the wheel head is made of wood. It's very, very heavy. So by propelling it with a stick, he's able to create momentum and, and able to have a, a moment, just a moment, to get some work done. Here's Hamada with uh, his hakeme. Hakeme is a Japanese word to describe the, uh, shall we say, the drop of the brush of white slip on the on the on the on the object. And he was particularly particularly dexterous with those brushes. As you see, if you look at the brushes carefully, you can see they're the kind of brushes that can't really be controlled. And he liked that. This is part of a 45 minute film that I <clears throat> reconstructed from the outtakes of the art of the potter and uh, the original film, if everybody, anybody gets a chance to see it, <clears throat> has um, a commentary by Juan Gardid Artigas. Here is Hamada with something that everybody dreams about. Every potter has tried it. Everybody has dreamt about being able to do this. This is, and this is, Hamada was doing this long before Jackson Pollock. Long, long before the action painters, Hamada came up with it. This is called a Nagashizuki. Uh, it's like splatter painting, as it were, not splatter painting, a dripped painting. Uh, which was a traditional Japanese technique, throwing glaze on on uh, the shoulders of pots and around the edges of pots. But uh, uh, Hamada did something quite different with it. Here he's preparing to uh, a platter uh, to um, which he will then cover. We, he, he will soon cover these patterns. These are patterns of um, sugarcane patterns. That was his signature pattern. And which he came up came up with in Okinawa, and the <clears throat> uh, he's soon going to be covering these with wax. Now he's covering them with wax, and the object will be the platter will be glazed, and the then the gla the wax resist will resist the glaze over those areas. You see, that is the wax resist in action. Hamada's platters are highly, highly collected around the world, and there are many famous people who have many of them. Joan probably knows more about this than I do. So you're, now you're asking why we want to film Hamada Shoji. <laughs> That's why, right? Those are, it's the magic moments that are there. And of course, they exist with other potters as well, but uh it's the volume the the environment the the collaboration with his workers hamada was very lucky because he moved to a pottery village and it, the village was filled with people who had skills people who knew how to make glazes people who know how to handle clay people who knew how to use the wheels and people who know, knew how to load and unload the kilns this was something that was unimaginable for the rest of us in the 70s. And Bernard Leach, when he moved to St. Ives, there was no one there to help him. But Hamada moved to a pottery village. He could call upon people and immediately engage people to uh, participate in the, uh, the new life that he was creating for himself. This goes back to the 1920s. I have films of Hamada in 1934, 1950, 1970. Uh, at 1970, uh, 50, yeah, 1970, it, from Mashiko, black and white and color films. <laughs> See, these are all people, as far as I know, these are all people who grew up in Mashiko or in the surrounding areas and all were very, very familiar with what needed to be done. Here's Hamada making an offering. 
to the gods for a, for a good firing. He, he's in front of his Noborigama climbing kiln. And then we wait two days to see the results. I hope there'll be an opportunity to show you the complete film someday. Well, Marty, I hope everybody else had goosebumps like I did watching that extraordinary footage um, of the man at work uh, and his team. I, I hope it was as rev revelatory to everyone else. It's to me uh, what a team it takes. And obviously the genius with the brush was the man himself, but everyone else was remarkably trained. Uh, do you know, how, I mean, Mushko was a pottery village before Hamada got there. Mm -hmm. um, the skill, and is there knowledge about the skill set of the workers that were there and how much training Hamada had to do to get them able to produce such consistent level of work? Well, you know, it, I, I would say he was a genius at finding the right people to help him. Uh, you know, he, he start he did stay before he established his pottery. He did not establish his pottery immediately. Before he established his pottery, he went to work in the Sakuma family residence. And I'm about to show you a uh, a uh, film with the grandson narrated by the grandson of the Sakuma family. And he lived with people for a long time before he, so he, by the time he opened up his own uh, workshop, before he established his own workshop, he already knew people. And it, there's a lot of stories attached to this. Of course, that a lot of people had trouble trusting him because he'd come, he arrived in a suit, <laughs> which many people had never seen before. You know, we have an image of him in his, you know, in his haori, but he arrived in a suit and they, they wondered if he might be a spy. They had no idea who he was. Nobody in, in Mashigo had ever been in Tokyo at that point, as far as we know. So the Sakuma, but the Sakuma family, the, the grandfather of the person uh, we're about to look at, uh, Sakuma Fujiya, or about to listen to Sakuma Fujiya, uh, relates stories about how his grandfather was attracted to Hamada and wanted to learn something new. But they had the skills. They just didn't know what to make. That sure. was what was. Yeah. Great. Uh, so let's turn to the next question. And the other important figure in the Minge movement, mm -hmm. uh, as, as many of you know and heard me say a few moments ago, is Bernard Leach, whose story in this discussion today intersects with your own. Could you tell us how it happened that you managed to acquire the 1930s footage of Bernard Leach's travels around Asia for the Minge Film Archive? Mm -hmm. And how was he significant for you, both as a potter yourself and as a professional filmmaker? Well, uh, I the story is that, you know, it, it, when people who were interested in learning about pottery, they were, the only thing to read about pottery making in Japan was Bernard Leach. There were lots of books about pots, but there weren't that many, there were no books about going to Japan and making them. So Bernard Leach was a seminal figure for many, many people who were curious about this new way of life, as it were. Um, but uh, I had made a film in Toronto in my studio that, where I work with children. And then I decided to make a second film about my bringing together my interest in Japan and pottery making and Japan. So uh, that film became the film Potters of Work, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, and um, so I was reading about um, Bernard Leach in Bernard Leach, and I was reading in a Potter in Japan, this book Potter in Japan, published in 1960, in which he talks about Onda, and in which he talks particularly about Onda, 
the village where I made my film, where I was about to make my film. And in that book, he mentions very briefly one sentence that no one else ever seems to have noticed. He says, when I showed the films that I had made in Mashiko 20 years ago to the people in Mashiko, everybody laughed when they saw themselves on the screen. So I thought, uh-huh, uh-huh. Who would have thought that Bernard Leach made films? Who would have, you know, you know, I mean, this is not YouTube days. This was filmmaking, right? You mean you had to have a movie camera to make a film in 1934. Uh, how all that happened, I, I subsequently discovered. So uh, to make a long story short, I reached out, I contacted, I made a phone call, I wrote letters, they didn't reply. There were no replies to letters, so I made, so I phoned and I got Bernard Leach's wife, Janet Leach, on the phone and explained to her that I was interested in these films. And uh, one thing led to another. I happened to be in London for the presentation of my first film, so I went to St. Ives. By that time, they had clearly already decided to give me the films. Leach was near the end of his life. He was going blind, and he, it turned out, was concerned about where the films would ultimately go. He didn't have a plan. And the fact I mean, I think the reason they're in my hands is I was the only one who was interested in them. <laughs> I was the only one who asked. Like a lot of things in life, you know, you're the first person to ask. You're the one who gets it. So uh, Leach and I had many discussions. Of course, I couldn't speak about Japan in any way close to the way he could speak about Japan. But I had been to Japan three times or so at that point, And we spoke about Japan. And then uh, I recorded those conversations. And uh, then when I brought the films back to him, because, of course, part of the arrangement was I was going to give him his films back, I restored the 16 millimeter films and made 16 millimeter copies and took them back and gave them back to him. And at that time, I recorded them. I, I recorded our conversations again, but I had now I knew what was on the films. So I was able to remind him. But because he was blind, he couldn't see the films at that time. He didn't see what I had done to, you know, put them back in projectable condition. That though, this is before video, of course. This was on sixteen millimeter film, but I then used those recordings that he and I had made, the audio recordings, to create commentary for the film that I'm about to show you. Um, and in this commentary, he talks about his great friendship and admiration for Hamada. And the revelations he made were some of them to me also, who had known him for 57 years as an intimate friend and never had the slightest ill feeling between us. I remember Hamada throwing, throwing with vigor and, uh, oh, wonderful, and I got a good light on it. He's the potter I admire most who is alive and the best craftsman as well, I think. Why? You ask the relationship of the man to his work. His work is free. Freest. What do I mean by free? His born nature is still working, still alive. His heart, that's the real heart of the middle of things. His head thinks, and his body that acts are in better harmony than any other man I have ever met. And he has chosen early in life, when he was about 25, I think, at, first of all, a technical school in Tokyo, and then the technical potter's training school in Kyoto, where he finally became a lecturer and demonstrator. Everybody in his workshop knew their precise job. They had a routine. There were the various stages of their training, from, I don't know what, age they started, I should think about 15, until 22 or so, I should think, before 22 to 25, when they became accomplished, finished, trained potters. From families who had followed this uh, pot making for some 200 years, or he looked around and chose them keeping an eye open for a likely letter. Oh, 
On the one hand, they spent perhaps more labor, actual hand labor, on making pots than we do. On the other hand, they had reduced this to the perfectly balanced modicum. Mm -hmm. It had a rhythm of its own. It was miraculous to watch. There was a good English to take directions from him that I never saw disregarded. There was a way of life long established in the air. It wasn't just at Mashka, it was all over Japan still. It must have been very much like this at one time in England, before the individualism attached to the education that accompanied the, the Industrial Revolution. So there's Bernard Leach speaking about yeah. the potter he most admires in the world. Amazing. Um, what miraculous footage. Uh, I hope it inspires all the potters in our audience to attain another level of artistry. Really amazing that this was saved for posterity. Thank you for being not only the first, probably the only person to pursue the acquisition of this valuable footage. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it makes a good story someday, but we'll save yeah. that for another time. Oh, yes. the, okay. Marty, you're a man of many, many stories. We could be here for 24 <laughs> hours at least, uh, but we're going to try to keep to our schedule um, sure. and uh, maybe we'll do session two at another date. So my third question to you is uh, Moshko itself is an area known to many in our audience because their familiarity with the work of Hamada and, of course, Shimoka Tatsu which by the way, are perched behind me. I have a large Subo by um, Shimoka and two terrific works by Hamada himself. Uh, in nearby Ibaragi, the great Kamoda Shoji and Wada Morihiro also brought their artistry a bit later in time after the war. I know you have a great deal of archival footage from this region. And needless to say, we would love, we'd just love to sit here all day long and watch these wonderful films. But in the interest of time, as I said before, uh, would you simply show us what this region was like 100 years ago? Furthermore, based on the footage you've been able to assemble from the first half of the 20th century and your one-on-one -on -one interviews, could you sort of give us a tiny summary of what have been the most notable changes in Moscow over the decades. Please. Well, uh, I think I, the, I'm going to let Mr. Sakuma answer some of those questions in the next film, but Hamada arrived in Mashiko in the 20s and 30s, just at the period when the world for craftspeople in Japan, in industrial Japan, was really changing. And the Mashiko's pots all went to Tokyo. And Tokyo was changing dramatically. Uh, there was sewage being, uh, you know, water pipes being installed, sewage being, being installed. People were moving into smaller and smaller quarters. So life in, in the city had its demands, and Mashiko had to keep up with, its, with the demands of the, of the changing demands in, in Tokyo. So um, here's the story as told much better by Mr. Sakum. ま、とにかく ね、
食べるため本当にやってたんだと思いますニーズがあるから作るとそれだけだったと思いますだからなんかもう信念持ってものづくりをするっていうのはやはり浜田が来て今度は芸術的なものを作ろうと思った人間たちが考えることであってこの当時ビデオの当時の人たちはそういう観念はないと思います。宗太郎はここの釜でずっと子供の頃から職人としてやってきましたよね。である日浜田先生が「まあ、遺体波山」っていうあの下館の陶芸家の先生のところへ来た時に山水の土瓶を見たわけですよね。でそれを見て「これはどこの焼き物ですか?」と浜田が尋ねたわけですよね。そしたらその先生は益子というこっから1時間電車に乗った先にあのそういう産地があるということで浜田はまず最初益子来てるんですよねその時今度は 2, 2回目2度目来た時には浜田益子で要は相撲を定住しようと思って来てるわけですよでその時に隣に乙っこし釜っていう私どもの福次郎が職人をしていた。で独立したその釜に浜田先生がろくろ狩りっていうのをしてたんですねろくろを借りちゃってるんですねお金有料ででそこの釜の仕事をしないで自分の自由な仕事をしてるわけですよで当然隣の釜元ですから東太郎の耳にもちょっと変わったもの作る人が来てるとで東太郎はもの珍しく通うわけですねで浜田の作ってる花瓶とか絵皿とかいろんなこうものを見せられるわけですねでトータルずーっと子供の頃から益子焼きの家業ばかりずっとやってきましてこう浜田の世界っていうのがこれまた楽しそうな部分に見えたんじゃないんですかねある日突然浜田を「先生うち来い」と「でうちのろくろで一緒にやろう」と呼んでしまったわけですでもその当時私の曽祖父は頑固な職人ですから福次郎。そんなもん許せねえと。で、焼き物は家業をやって当たり前だと。浜田の作ってるもんなんかそんなダモノだみたいなそういう言い方をしたわけですね。ここは保守的な町なんで、浜田先生みたいな人はちょっと今で言うあのなんつうでしょうねテロリストみたいな。<笑>そういうイメージで子供たちに石投げられたとかなとかってそういう保守的なんですよ益子ってで変わったことしてる人ってそういうふうに見えちゃうじゃないですかあの問屋さんがこう全部あの引き取って東京に出してるような世界ですから問屋さんが受け付けないものはお金にならないわけですよねですんでこう,うちの曽祖父福次郎もそんなもん作ったってお金になんねえからやめろって言ったぐらいですから家業してれば、あのー、問屋がそうやって売ってくれるとお金も間違いなく入るから大丈夫だからっていうわけですけど浜田先生は売る術を持ってたんですよねその時にもううちの東太郎やりたくて抵抗してじゃあ、あのー、昼間は工場を家業やりますと。で夜サイクバンが開いた時に一緒にやらせてくれとでその時あの夜は先ほども言ったように電気がないですからランプをつけて2人で作り合ったとまあ浜田さんはそういう部分で先生はいろんなものを見て知って作れるトータルは何も知らなくてもろくろの技術あったわけですね。ですから浜田のやってるものを身を見まねでどんどんどんどん作ってってで、まあ、こういう世界に今行き着いたとで浜田先生やっぱり来た頃ちょうど亀やすり鉢の需要っていうのがどんどん減ってった時期なんですよね東京の上質移動が取ったおかげで、あのー、亀の需要がないんですよねで私どもこう亀作ってるのが主要な釜の製品ですからこれは何とかしなくちゃなんないっていう時に浜田先生が見えて民間運動が起きて
それでそういう民芸的な作品がこう世に出るようになったんですちょうど切り替え時期だったんですねですから浜田先生来なかったらちょっと益子の顔とやばい部分もあったんじゃないでしょうかねもう浜田が益子へ来る二度目来る頃にはもうそういうふうになってましたね東京が上水道を引かれるようになって。結局その需要がなくなって益子これからどうしようかっていう時期だったと思うんです。で浜田が来てこういうものを作ってるっていうので切り替えた人たちはどんどんこう切り替えていったわけですね。それまではこれが主要ですからうちそんなにあの長い時間はいなかったと思うんです。あのお家を移築するまで今のところにあの古屋を買ってますから古屋を移築するまで。の期間しかかいなかったと思うんですよねで当然あの浜田先生あの文章に残してることあるんですけど夏なんですけどあの瀬戸屋さんって儲からないんで自給自足ですよね田んぼでお米を作ったり畑で野菜を作ったりちょうど浜田先生来た時に夏の時期だったんですね。ナスが取れるんですよたくさん。<笑> Well, he answers much better than I would have, don't you think? <laughs> His insights、um, into、uh, the economics and、mm. how economics、mm. drove、um, invention, if you will,、right. and right. how Hamada seems to have been the right man for that moment in time、mm -hmm. to bring the sleepy <laughs>、uh, functional market of Moscow into the middle of the 20th century. Uh, yeah. Very insightful by Sakuma san. Right. Well, one of the running points throughout the work and research and commentaries that I'm collecting is that the Iminge artists were, were all mom and pop shops. People were concerned with making things that other people needed, their neighbors needed. And, and as the needs changed, they had to adapt. And sometimes they didn't know how to adapt. So,、uh, the Minge, the leaders and the founders of the Minge movement were often very influential in terms of helping them to adapt. And Bernard Leach was one person who also helped the potters of Kyushu to adapt to the modern world. One of the most extraordinary, tiny insights he had was the、uh, fortuitous meeting between Itea Hazan、hmm. and And Hamada. And for those of our audience, that name may ring a bell in the back of their minds.、Uh -huh. It's because you may have seen the Meiji Modern Show at Asia Society or currently at the、um, Smart Museum at the University of Chicago, where for many people, the star piece in the show is a work by Itaya Hazan that came to the Walters Art, art Gallery, to the Walters family uh, uh -huh. from uh, 1913, which、uh -huh. is the total opposite. Of what Hamada is so aesthetically hantai, the opposite、exactly. of very refined, very elegant porcelain、right. work with multi layers of colored glazing, exploring all sorts of different technical devices to make something nominally functional, but more of a bijutsu heen in the sense of Western art. So,、right. what an amazing、uh, inspiration or, for Hamada. I, I, it's wonderful. Well, Ham、uh, Hamada was a student of Itaya Hazan's, and apparently he respected him so much that he would go out to his studio on the weekends to volunteer to help him.、Yeah. And in spite of the, the simplicity that you see in the works of Hamada, the limited number of glazes that he uses, the using of the single clay, Hamada was a very, very sophisticated glaze chemist. It was his decision to limit himself. And deepen his knowledge by the use of knowledge and technique and、yes. skill by the use of, of a limited number of local materials. That was a decision he made. It wasn't just this is what's here. Are there any extant examples of his work working in the Itia's studio? I mean, did he work with porcelain? Any point in time? I don't know. I don't I, You know, the answer to qu that question, the, the only person, people who could answer that question are the people at the, at the Tokyo、uh, Tech Institute、mm. of Technology, who are major historians、yeah. and they have very early works going way, way、yeah. back. And they do have a museum and an archive. And the archivist、yeah. is quite. I interviewed the archivist actually at one point for another film about Hamada. Yeah. Oh, here's grounds for someone's master's thesis, perhaps. <laughs> well, okay.、Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, Marty, in the interest of time, we're going to move to my next question, which is a two-part question. Mm -hmm. um, following on that totally amazing video, I'd like to know more about your restoration process and the work that you do at the Mingay Film Archives. Mm -hmm. Firstly, what is the process of restoring this film in a physical sense? Well, the, um, the, um, the, 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 it's changed dramatically. When I first did the films, the, the only medium you could move from a film from was one film copy to another film copy. So you had a 16 millimeter film, you had to run it through something like a movie projector to duplicate it. It was called an optical printer or a printer, whatever, but you, at the end result, you got a, a new copy of the same thing, uh, slightly degraded, of course, less less sharp, less in focus. But now with digital restoration, we can we have digital restoration machines that um, can restore and digitally clean uh, endlessly. I mean, many of us, of course, are. are constantly watching old films that have been digitally remastered but I can show some examples here uh, of what the before and after looks like Uh, on the left hand side, you see among the other things, among the things that we're able to do is to stabilize the image um, digitally by locking the center in the picture, the center vis a vis the outside frames, the frame. So scratches are removed, dust particles are removed, and the films are stabilized. And here, re repairing splices. That, and this is physical work as well as digital work, which, which I'm able to do because I, yeah. So I can replace, uh, I can repair splices, I can repair bro broken perforations. Yeah, this is first. So it's a combination of physical work and digital work. In most cases, I actually have the original films that you're seeing. I have them in my own storage facility in Toronto. So here's a perfect example. On the left, you have an old videotape copy. And on the right, you have directly from film. So Marty, my second part of that same question is how do you manage to get these extraordinary commentaries in order to provide the context needed to understand these mostly silent films? Right. Well, what can I say? I make them. <laughs> How do I get them? I make them. You know, I make them, meaning I go and talk to people. And um, this is, is, surprise, surprise, there are a lot of interesting people out there and you know, waiting to tell their stories and they just need somebody to listen. But because I have this film material, it's not abstract. I don't have to call upon people. I don't interview people as let's say an ordinary journalist might interview people i show them films and while i'm showing them films i hope i elicit commentaries and then i ask questions right so i sit with them i have my laptop it's quiet i can sit in front of my laptop there's no noise and i can just ask people to tell me what they remember and what they see so shall i show you an example yeah this is my my dear friend uh, sakuma uh, uh, Sakuma, sorry, uh, Sakamoto Shigeki, who appears in my film Potters at Work in 1976. If anybody remembers the film, The Father and the Son, he passed away last year. And I'm very, you know, happy and honored that I have a, a long series of interviews with him. Uh, and this is a portion of one of them in which he talks about the life of the rural potters of Onda. じゃあ、お客さんは買うために温田まで来たんですか? 
リーチの後はどこまでか車を雇ってあれこれはリーチの後ありましたもうリーチの後はい、うんえー、よそにまあ親戚とかどっかに置いといてそこから売りに行ってね、うん、随分そんなことをしました、うん、しかしリーチさんの後はそう売りいかんでもよくなったですお客さんが買いに来てくれましたからね、うんうん、リーチの前は前はそういうふうに売りに出たんですよ、うん、売りに出た、うん、はい下まで来たとかかなり遠くまでまあ遠方まで行って45日かかって売ってしまったら結局は飲んでしまって帰ってきたとか<笑><笑>でも徳さん帰る時にお金と野菜とかいろいろ持って帰ったんですかいやまあまあいろいろ持って帰るそうですよ長い,長い人はねもう10日も20日も帰ってこんとえところがその今度はその当時はその売りに行った先も金がないので今度米をやるからとか小豆をやるからとかいやねここは少ないからそ,のそれで物々交換ですねそれでそんなのは持って帰ったでしょうが金は飲んで<笑>ね、私みたいなのは飲んでしまって帰って<笑>だから怒られるもう大、ね、げんかになるわけや帰ったらお金なくなってなくなっちゃうそんなまあそれはそ全部じゃないですけどねそんなことがありますまあ、それはそれはそれはそれはそれはそれは Exactly、right. But the point I wanted to make is I mean, this is the original, this is the cashless society. Yes. They, they, he, they didn't have it. Onda, as you know,、uh, is in a valley with the river and mountains. They don't have enough farmland. They don't have enough rice paddies. So he had to go to the local villages. And what he had to give the people in the local villages was pots. Yeah. Barter system. Barter well, system. Now that we, I know you have so much material on the Onda tradition, I want to pick a different location and talk about Tamba for a moment.、Okay. Um, many of our audience members, I'm sure, are familiar with Tamba that's equidistant between Kyoto and Osaka in Kansai,、um, which I understand was the focus of a series of films that you only just recently restored. How did ceramic production in Tamba differ from what we've just seen in、um, Mashko? And also, while working on these films for the Minge Film Archive, did you come across any startling films from Tamba that were perhaps even surprising? Well, un unfortunately, what happened was I found a film、um, on videotape. VHS, but I've never been able to find the original 16 millimeter or 8 millimeter copy. I've done multiple visits to Tamba, and、um, uh, there are all kinds of stories, but it looks like the film material may have been just thrown out by somebody who was moving from a house to an apartment and didn't have any space for it. So,、um, what I was able to do instead was because I, in the interim of my many visits to Tamba, Tachikui village in Tamba, my, I became good friends with Ichino Shigeko, the widow of Ichino Shigeyoshi, who had been at the Leech Pottery in, 19,、uh, in the 1970s.、Uh, and because she's such a wonderful talker and such a great friend, I decided to create a kind of slideshow with her voice. And I used photographs that were taken by Janet Leach, who was then,、uh, who, had, who married Bernard Leach in 1956, but she had been in Tamba for two years, 53 and 54.、Uh, and she took a lot of photographs, and especially her photographs reflect the lives of women. So、I'm, I arranged, I interviewed Shigeko about the lives of women. In Tamba. So that, that's the story that we have to tell about,、uh, about uh, uh, Tamba as of now. ないので、わらで、まくと、あの、割れなくて、遅れるから。あの、豚屋さんとか、まあ、酒屋さん、お醤油屋さんとか、の注文が入ると、そこへ、そういうとこ収めたりしてた
グリワンカシはわらとそれから縄ねわらで作った縄で荷造りしてたんですねだからこの十文字になってるとこは縄でくくってるから周りはわらをこう当てて荷造りしてるんですね小さいこの壺流した三種の味噌漬けとかを入れる壺三つずつぐらいあの五つか四つか五つかなそのわらをでこういうふうにして水ぶりして、うん、子供やに手伝ってるわけやねあの巻き作ったんを針金のとこへこう巻きを入れて作ってるわけ巻きは大事社会みなこの山で薪を取ってきたんをそこに置いてそこでみんな作業してたわけやねその家の,あの炊事場でそのご飯炊いたりお風呂沸かしたりとかして使うのを作ってたこの山道写真では子供が手伝ってる写真やね、うん、だからちっちゃいお姉ちゃんが小さい妹さんの背中に追ってるとこやねこれおんぶしてるとこやね家の手伝いをみんなしてたんやね昔は。半の半島で半分は、まあ、あの野良仕事田んぼ行ったりとかしてほんであとは、まあ、家の,その焼き物を手伝うっていうのはそれから農飯器とかそういう時には田植えの準備で野良仕事で秋になるとまた稲刈りの仕事で冬は山へしばしに行ったりとか昔は。ご飯炊くのも今でこそ炊飯器があるけど薪で炊いたりお風呂も薪で炊いたりしてだからみんなお正月から2月の3月ぐらいまでは山行き言って山へみんなしばしに行ってたご飯炊いたりとかお風呂沸かしたりとかあのガスがないからみんなそれをがあの燃料になってたのねだから男の人はその間家でろくろで仕事してた。わらやのねわらは昔大あの田んぼした後の藁大事やったから荷造りしたりするのに荷巻きをするのにねだから今はもう田んぼもみんなしてもらってるけどもみんなもう藁はカットしてしまって田んぼへ巻いてするけど昔はみんな藁残していったから自分のとこでとあの稲からこのもみに秋に稲刈りしてでもみにした時のその藁を全部こうして積んで置いとくんでそれとそれから釉薬に使うのに藁灰作るのに燃やして灰にしたりするのに置いてたりとか釉薬作る藁の灰を作るためにこれを燃やしてするのにあの囲って置いとくわけ。田んぼが住んで稲刈って手で稲刈りするので,でそれをあの藁でくくっていくわけ。うちおばあさんやわこれ<笑>年子一の年子田植えこれうちのおばあさんだがおってん違うかな田植えこの縁あでっていうねこの土のとこだけでそこへ今度豆さんを植える枝豆お米はもうこっちだけでその田んぼと土手との間にこうちょっとこのぐらいの土をずっとあのしてんであの水漏れ田んぼで水がこっちの方に流れんようにその土で、まあ、囲いするわけねでそのとこにもったいないから豆さんをこう植えてその田植えするまではあの男の人がしたりとか派手塗ったりとか男の人がするけど田植えるのはみんな女の人腰は痛いしだからそなしてここで今立ち食いで田植えしてるけども田植えだけでその焼き物だけで食べていけへん時があったみたいで女の人が田植えしに痛みとか昔はこういう田んぼのとこが多かったからだからそこの百姓屋さんから「田植えに来てください」って言われてだから痛みの方まで田植えしのおばあさん行った言うてはった泊まりがけででお金持って帰ってきよったそれとおじいさんが怒ってはった「そんな格好の悪いことして」言うて。<笑>田植えこなしてしてもらったらそこの自分とこのその田んぼを植えてもらう時にはお昼この人たちに食べてもらうのを若い嫁さんがお昼のごちそうして田んぼへ持っていくわけでそこで食べてもらうわけ
釜の忙しい時はその釜の品物運んだりとかそういうのしてやっぱし女の人の仕事ですごく<笑>多い。<笑>モンペテンそのノラギアねまいたらノラ仕事する時にあのこれは前と後ろとその紐がついてるわけ。社会にあのゴム昔はゴムやないから紐で送って仕事しやすいわねモンペの方があの女の人はカラスギで男の人はアイコンアイコンででも男の人は本人に白の糸でこうでで紐は白の紐でしてたねおばあちゃんがみんな作ってました。So the lives of women in the pottery village. Half the、yeah. time in the fields. Women's work is never done. And、never. that even does, does not discuss the raising of children and maintaining the、right. house.、Mm. Well, the, 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 the entire film, if you have a chance someday to watch the entire film, a lot of those things are discussed, including hauling water. They had no wells. A lot of people didn't have their own wells. They had to haul water up and do, go, go to the river to wash, to wash and to clean vegetables. And women's There was a lot, of, the women were very busy for sure. Thank you for the amazing pictures.、Uh, for my final question, Marty,、um, because of the prominence of the leaders of the Mingay ceramic culture, such as Hamada and Bernard Leach, not everyone may know that the Mingay movement also encompasses other media, from textiles to furniture to paper. Uh, can you just give us a brief overview of the Mingay world outside of ceramics that you find particularly interesting? Well, I, I, the, I have a, some films on textiles. There are some remarkable、um, materials on textiles that I'm about to start working on.、Uh, it'll be too long to talk about it now, and I have no examples to show. We do have a short film on paper making that I've just completed last year. Uh, in which I interviewed a、uh, 93 year old papermaker、uh, for the commentary. The film is from 1938. And since we're running out of time, I'll stop talking and let him talk. Some of the things that I've done in the film is that the film is a very good thing. It's 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 a very good thing. これは全部昔は手作業でやったもんなんだ。はい。300回、400回ってやります。右手でやったり、左手でやったりして。ほんで、その、この過ぎ方の何も、私でも、77年やってきました。15歳の時から、今92歳ですから、77年間。今、攪拌したものを中に原料を攪拌して細かく水槽の中で入れて、えー、したものとろろ青いといいまして植物性の粘液を混ぜ合わしますそれが適量と言いますけれどこの混ぜ具合によって紙の具合が随分違ってくるんですそれでこのとろろを2杯入れるか3杯入れるかそれの呼吸が随分大事なんです。これから紙すきにすっかで入ります。最初これを化粧水と言います。これを横ゆると言います。横ゆでね。これを横ゆると言います。これを持たせると言います。まあこれ今中ゆるやってますけどね。はい。はい、横ゆるをやります。これは中ゆると言います。もう持たせるってこういうふうな仕方もあるけどこれは今こうやって流しているわね
この古典に重力がかかってきますのでこれは天井に上に竿がありますこの竿によって重力をある程度緩和させるあの、まあ、一つのなんていうの道具といいますかねそれがあってそれでうまく調整しているんですだから何年やっても厳しいですこの一日の好き上がったものが好き方は長崎の基本で決まっていますけれど厚さを全部揃える水の上でついたものが乾燥した時になっていると同じ厚さになっているとそれが上手な好き方ということなんです厚さが3問目な3問目でと初めの映像かもしれ動く写真かもしれないですね、はい、前の,あのもっと古い映像を見たことありますかいやあまりないんです。うん。それどういう写真そのものが百年前のものはあまりないんです。うん。この辺はそういうふうで写真に撮られるとか写真に写して残すというようなことはあまりなかったです。はい。それ今そういう映像を見たらどういう感じですか？佐藤さん自身。あのね、簡単に言いますと100年前まではカミスキっていうのはおとなしく従順で部屋の中で部屋の中で同じ紙を丁寧に好きなさいよって、うん、あの紙を透けるということは体が丈夫ってことなんです。ほんで今度はあの自分に外のものとのお付き合いがないんです。前も生じ、横も生じ、後ろも遮断したところで黙ってこうやって髪をすいているだけなんです。一日中、一年中、十年でも。だからって、髪はいい髪は透けるようになっても、人間的な成長はないんです。うん、だから、結婚すると矛盾があるんです。<笑>はい。<笑>長所と短所はどうしてもあるんです。ほ<笑>ん<笑>で、まあ、ほんで、そういうことを、私んたも体験していますから、男やで、死いてばっかおって、それをあの、かごの取りてたよね。カウンターは自由が利かんでしょう。ほんで一生懸命カウンターするけど、窮屈になってまって耐えられんで、途中で外へ飛び出すというのは。ほんで、女の人の方が余計これを耐えて吸いたということなんです。だから、自分たにそういう苦しい体験を積んできますと、よくぞ1300年、先祖の人たちが耐え忍んで、吸いてきましたついてこられましたそれに感謝してますはい本当感謝です自分体験のその頃がよく分かりますからうん今は頭に知識はあるけれど体で覚えてないし心が練ってないんです体験がないから頭でま知ってるだから体験を積んで心を練りなさいっていうの練ってだんだんだん心を広くするの短期になってこうじゃなしにあなるほどなという方もそういう心の中のダメだって言ってわしはあの今弟子に教えてるんです。What to say such wisdom from a 93 year old、right. and from the last century. Right. Well, the beauty of it all is that, excuse me, the beauty of it is the gratitude that people feel for the knowledge they've inherited. And the knowledge that they've inherited is indeed、uh, important and worth preserving and worth understanding and at least worth recognizing. Yeah, thank you, Marty.、Uh, it's been a, a wonderful 
departure. Um, what I'd like to do now is actually go to the Q&A because we've had a series of questions um, that definitely only you can answer. A couple people have asked, where can we find these films? What, yeah. what is, mm. you know, this is amazing. They all want to see more. Uh, can you mm. help people to guide them and, and maybe tell us a little bit how they can be more involved with the Mingay Film Archives? Mm. Well, thank you. I mean, of course, I'm eager to show films. I'm, I'm at this stage. I'm still in production, so I'm not, um, you know, putting everything up on YouTube. But I uh, would welcome requests, and um, if people request film, particular films or particular information, uh, we'll be happy to provide it on a one by one basis. We're also, of course, I mean, thank you for this, Joan. We're also, uh, as always, look always looking for ongoing support for this project, which is, uh, you can imagine, or maybe you can't imagine how expensive all this is. Um, so we're continuing looking for uh, more patrons and more donors. The donations to the to this project can be tax deductible in America and in, in uh, Canada and also in the UK. But if people would, but the long-term plan, which is to hopefully find an institution somewhere with a proper digital archiving system that could take this over. And I am talking to universities. The most, the University of Toronto is an important uh, participant and patron for this project. So the University of Toronto may eventually put everything online or perhaps some other institution. And I hope to donate this project to an institution in Japan uh, the Minge Kang, the Japan Folkcraft Museum will get it, uh, the Leech Pottery in England, and um, in America, I'm still thinking and still looking. But if people would li like to see anything in particular or would require more information, they should just write to us, please. Thank you, Marty, for all that you do to um, make this material uh, available to people, to preserve it. And um, surely as time marches forth and Japan becomes such a modernized, even more modernized country, um, this will look quite miraculous to generations ahead of us. Um, for those of you who want to see this again, I already see the people are asking that question. Um, we will have this available on our website probably in another 10 to 14 days where you can also catch our other previous Zoom presentations. Um, and I just briefly want to recommend a few other exhibitions that are must-sees that are, are around this country. Uh, if someone can move the next slide, yes. Uh, Radical Clay, if you want to see sort of where Mingay started this all and where it has led to, uh, this is the show to see, which will be traveling around this country and has a marvelous book um, uh, edited by Joe Earle. Uh, Porcelains in the Mist, which will be for us in New York, available uh, for really almost the, the remainder of this year. And then also we'll be traveling around this country. Uh, the remarkable uh, Kondo family in Kyoto with, a, again, a very different aesthetic. And um, the Toshiko Takayezu uh, exhibition that's currently in Long Island City at the Noguchi Foundation and stupendously installed with a great book attached to it and will be slowly making its way west at a number of museums, uh, ending up in Honolulu, uh, the birthplace of Takaezu. Um, in addition, there are three major exhibitions of Japanese art that are of uh, older art forms. Meiji Modern, which I previously mentioned, is currently in Chicago before it hence heads to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, none whatsoever, the fabulous Zenga exhibition from the Gitter Yellen collection uh, that has moved to here in Japan society. And also in New York, uh, Hiroshige's uh, Hyakumeisho, Edo Hyakumeisho, which is uh, ingeniously installed at the Brooklyn Museum. So while you're there to see Kondo, don't be sure to see Hiroshige's exhibition. Indeed, together, two for one. And finally, our own next show, which opens uh, very shortly on layered clay, which examines the role of Nerikomi and Neriage in the current Japanese ceramic tradition. Uh, we have an online catalog, which you can find on our website. And um, we have 
uh, will have, and that I should you will find it as of May 1st, and um, information about each of the artists is available there. So thank you all for sticking with us, whatever time zone you're in, those people in Russia, God knows, you know, time to uh, wake up practically. And um, those in Japan who are woken up and for those of us um, who want to rush off to dinner, I, it's great to have you all with us. And Marty, you've been fabulous. This has been a joy and a privilege to work with you. So okay. thank you very much for all the preparation it took to make this mm -hmm. evening so informative and so uh, captivating. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity again and for your support. Good night, everybody.